very intriguing night and a wonderful night. I've had um, the last half hour to talk on and off with Dale. Um, our presenter was part of our long, um, year-long grant-funded series to promote engagement with the issues that matter most to our society, and we're calling this series REACT, which stands for Read, Engage, and Come Together. For March and April, we are offering programs, discussion, and special resource lists that highlight the issue of climate change. I'll put these on the back next to Dale's book. It's for sale as well. Tonight, we welcome Dale Lynette, who was born and raised in Athol, Massachusetts. Since the early 1970s, he's lived within two miles of the Quaggan Reservoir and was an active birder, fisher, and hiker throughout his youth. And I would maintain from seeing some of his images that he still is. Dale then spent 28 years working at Quaggan as an educator and a naturalist with the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation retiring in 2014. Secrets of the Quabbin Watershed is a result of three years and many thousands of hours spent on the 82,000 acre Quabbin Reservoir Watershed in central Massachusetts photographing wildlife. Tonight he will share with us the many stories and photographs of the animals of the area. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight and let's give a warm welcome to Dale. Well, thanks everybody for coming down tonight. Um, has anybody here been to the Quabbin? Are you familiar with the Quabbin? Anybody that I, that's not familiar with the Quabbin? No, well, the Quabbin, the Quabbin Reservoir, to make a long story short, the Quabbin Reservoir is an 18 mile long reservoir in mid Massachusetts that was built in the 30s. And they took four towns and they totally destroyed them. They cut down all the trees. Um, they took down, they, they um, disinterred, let's see, was it 40, 4,600 graves? They moved out 38 graveyards. And so they built a large dam at the bottom of the, uh, the valley and they backed the water up. And that's the water supply for the communities around Boston and in western Massachusetts, Wil Wilbraham, South Hadley, um, I forgot the other, the other two out there. But since it's been there since 1938, there's been no hunting until the 90s when they started hunting deer. So it, it's turned into a wonderful wildlife sanctuary. Um, for the people in here that are uh, camera, camera people, people always come up to me at the end of these talks and ask me what I've used for camera equipment. So I'll tell you before, before I even start the show, I use Nikon equipment. Um, I have a Nikon D850 and a D810 and I have my main lens is a 500 millimeter lens. I try and stay as far away from the animals as I possibly can. Um, like it doesn't look like it with this, but I was probably um, 50 or 60 yards from this bobcat and I had a 500 millimeter lens and I took the picture and the cat disappeared. And I've also blown this up on the computer so it looks like I was right there. But you're gonna see a lot of pictures tonight that look like I'm chasing birds, and, but I can tell you that's not the case. So I retired in 2014, and the first thing that happened to me was a friend of mine worked for the Telegram, it was the Telegram, and he said, hey Dale, he said, how'd you like to do an article, uh, like, like me to do an article about you and how the changes have happened to the Quabbin in the 30 years and your impending photography. I had no idea at the time I was going to write a book. So I said, sure, Brad. So he interviewed me and he put the article out in the Worcester Telegram and this was the headlines. So I called him up and I said, hey, Brad, I said, what's this free range <laughs> photographer, you know? <laughs> well, he says, I didn't do that. He says, the, the editor did it. So I got to thinking about it and I thought, well, I might as well come clean. If I'm a free range photographer, I have no antibiotics, no <laughs> added vitamins, and no growth hormones. 
And then people always say to me, how, how do you get these pitches? How do you do this, you know? And I say, well, I just happen to be in the right place at the right time. But what, what they don't know is I've spent thousands and thousands of hours waiting. I never knew I had so much patience until, until I retired. And I like going into beaver ponds. Sometimes I go in in the morning before the sun comes up. And if you ever try this, if you go into a pond or a beaver pond or sit on uh, the shore of a lake, after 15 to 20 minutes, you kind of, you feel like you blend in. And, and a lot of people say to me, well, I can't, I can't wait 15 to 20 minutes. I have a friend that walks all the time. He's a great photographer. But he says, oh, I can't sit. I got to see what's around the corner. So I figure I'm, I'm rewarded. Sometimes I'll go out and I'll spend four, four and a half hours and see nothing. And sometimes I'll go out and I'll come, come out there four hours later and I've got four or 500 pitches to go through. So I saw this by Ralph Waldo Emerson and I thought, I'm gonna have that tattooed across my forehead. So we'll start in the spring. So we're at the Quabbin, and this is the Munson Turnpike Road that goes on the eastern side of the reservoir. You can see it's, it was you know, taken up in the 30s, and that is what they call Soapstone Mountain. And you can look south and you can, you can climb up there and you get a heck of a view. And I like to spend a lot of time in beaver ponds, and this is what you see if you're at the Quabbin now, or actually anywhere in Massachusetts. These animals, you can see them up here tonight, but they're all over Massachusetts. So you can just take everything that I tell you tonight and just extrapolate it out to your areas, and there you go. So I'm gonna talk about beavers first. I love beavers. They weigh between 30 and 50 pounds. The North America's largest rodent, the capybara, in South America is the largest. They range from two to th three feet long. They've got shiny guard hairs covering, they have two different types of fur. They've got long guard hairs, as you can see, on the outside, and then they've got real thick fur underneath. They can stay underwater for 15 minutes. And the one that amazed me is the beavers have 77,000 hairs per square inch. And, and that's one reason why they can stay under the water when it's really cold. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, who the heck ever came up with that? How did they figure that out? <laughs> and there was one beaver clan that I got to uh, hang out around, and I was in there so much. And I found one day that if I set myself up, I can take pictures of them coming up working on the dam, the dam stretched out in front of me. And they got so used to seeing me standing there that I could stand right out front behind my camera and, and they would come in and out and in and out and every now and then they'd, they'd flash me a look. And uh, I, this guy popped up one day and he kind of just stood up and sniffed me a little bit and took his picture and then off he, off he went. They have a, a substance um, that's called castorum that um, they, it's, they secrete it at the base of their tail and it's a, like a, a thick, um, like honey, but it's, it's waterproofing. And you can see this guy right here, what he's doing is he's getting the castorum, they put it in their feet and if you ever see them, they'll be sitting on a log and they'll, they'll be going like this with their feet and they'll be going like this down their chest and they're spreading this castorum uh, substance around their body to keep them from uh, getting waterproof, uh, I mean, to keep them waterproof. Beavers have flaps in their nose and in their ears and they have special lenses that come down over their eyes so they can go underwater and when they dive, because those flaps are there, it keeps the water out of their ears keeps water out of their nose and they can see just as well underwater as they can on the, on the surface. Their tail, they use it to store fat in. Uh, sometimes, like 
like now, if they have a tough winter, especially young beavers, if they don't have enough food cashed up for the winter, then they're not going to make it. But they carry a lot of fat in their tail, so they can live on their fat. That'll get them a little bit extra time in the winter. And this is sort of a warning signal. If you've ever heard them do it, it sounds like a big, somebody throws a big rock in the water and it's got this big kasplunt. And uh, my camera can take nine uh, frames a second, so it can, it can freeze it. So this is, this is one that I almost fell over backwards in the chair when I saw that. It's an older beaver. Um, I don't know whether it was fighting or what happened, but I just thought that this beaver looks like it's probably quite old. And all of the hours I spend watching animals, I swear that animals have a sense of humor. And this particular day, I had the uh, lens pointed on this great blue heron. It was in the spring, a little bit later than it is now. And I saw this beaver swimming along and it got right behind the heron and I was watching it and I thought this I wonder what's going to happen and the beaver got right behind the heron and he let go one of those big splashes and the heron almost jumped out of his feathers <laughs> but I was right on the spot for that one uh, in the spring the beavers eat these uh, pond lilies, you can see where this guy's been before I showed up on the scene. And they're really dainty with, with their, their long toes. And if you ever watch them, they turn them around and it's just like, uh, you know, eating a banana or, or a corn on the cob or something. And they crack me up because they always stick their tail up in the air when, when they're doing this. And there you, you get a good look at the almost leather-like tail. And I only see them eating grass in, in the middle of the summer. I don't know what it is about the grass that attracts them in the summer, but there's just two or three weeks in the middle of the summer that they'll come out of the water and they'll start uh, eating the, um, the grass. And then in the hot, heat of the summer, they spend a lot of time in their lodge. They'll pack it up and they'll stay there when it's really hot. Then you see them out. They're, they're what they call crepuscular, which means they're active in the morning and at dusk. And they, there's, you can see their teeth. They have two, two teeth on the top and two teeth on the bottom. And they have to chew all the time because if they don't, the teeth will grow and they have to wear the teeth down. And if they get older and they have a problem and their teeth just grow and grow and grow, then they're, they'll starve to death because they won't be able to eat bark from the trees. And I've got a couple of videos that I want to show you. They're just few minute videos. But if you've never seen a beaver chewing, now this guy, this guy was working on a, on a, a, a log that's, that's under, under the water. They have the strongest teeth of any animal that I've seen. Watch this. And I'm out of here. And he took that over and he put it right up on the dam. I was pretty close to the dam. And then this guy, I saw this coming down the pond one day and I couldn't figure out what it was until I noticed there was a beaver right there pulling this 12 to 15 long, foot long branch. There you can see the eye right there. So when somebody says, well, you must be busy as a beaver, you can take that as a compliment because th these guys never stop. And in the fall, you'll see them doing this. They pack, they get their, um, 
their lodge all ready for the winter. They packed mud up there. And when I was a kid, it was a, a, a myth that the beavers used to pack mud on their tail and you know, swim around with it, but they don't. They carry that with their feet in their mouths and they put it, they fill in all the holes to keep the cold air out. And they also will cut twigs and um, small trees and they'll bring them in and they'll put them right next to the lodge and they call this caching. So they can spend, they'll, they'll get enough up there so they'll have enough to last them through the winter. Um, young beavers, in, inexperienced beavers, sometimes they don't quite get enough and that's, that's when they get into trouble. Um, I have seen beavers out on the ice in the middle of the winter and I've seen trails along the ponds that they've come out and they've evidently they've run out of food so that they're out looking for food. And this, this, this clan right here, you can see they haven't put their television antenna up yet. <laughs> and this is what it looks like in the dead of winter. There, are five, there were five beavers in this lodge. And sometimes if it's really, really cold and if you happen to be around one of these, you can see some steam coming up out of there. It looks like they're, you know, they've got a little wood stove going in there, but it's just, it's just the body heat because they, they, uh, the biologists claim that these lodges, they, it doesn't get below 32 degrees in there all through the winter. I've never spent the winter in one of these, so I don't know. And this is what I like about this time of year right now because when I see things like this, there's just one thing that pops into my mind, otters. And otters used to be, real, they used to be really hard to find. But about 10 or 12 years ago, when the state banned um, the trapping with the leg hole traps and all of that went down, um, the otter trapping just kind of stopped. Nobody wanted to go to all the work for what they could catch. So the otters are everywhere. Um, at least they are out near Quab and um, they weigh between 11 and 30 pounds. Um, they're, they're a little, little longer than a beaver. They're 26 to 42 inches. Now look at this, they have 40, 450,000 hairs per square inch. Now, uh, can you imagine a, a biology, wildlife biology student getting assigned for his, his class project to get a square inch of beaver fur and count how many hairs there are on it. Um, and they can go, they go like the wind underneath water. And they can, they can swim as fast as seven, seven miles an hour. And uh, they claim they can go as deep as 665 feet. And they call them river otters, but they're not really, they're, they're found anywhere that there's water. And they don't really get along good with um, beavers. There's a beaver right here. And I was watching this guy one day and he was on his way back. It was around eight o'clock in the morning, quarter of eight, and he was on his way back to the lodge. And I spotted this otter working his way along, along the shore looking for fish and frogs and anything. And the beaver went by the otter, and he saw the otter, and he banged a yui, and he came right back. And he, he went right in. He went right in after the otter. I've seen this numerous times, but I've never seen them come to blows. They never fight each other. They just have a, you know, the, the otter takes a nutty, and then he does this for three or four minutes, and growls and hisses and barks and makes all kinds of noise and then they go their own way. But I love these guys. They're mainly fish eaters, but they eat frogs. I've seen them playing with turtles. Um, they're very, their family units stay together um, for a year and a half to two years. And I was talking about Lake Mattawa. It has a camp on Lake Mattawa. These three, otters were on Lake Mattawa two, two years ago in the spring and I watched them, this one's got a fish, and, and I watched them for 15 to 20 minutes and then, it, and then it dawned on me that my camera takes video. 
so here again, if you've never, if you've never seen uh, otters in action, here we go. Not fun to eat alone, especially when you have two brothers. And I never know when, when I'm going to see an otter. It was a car. That flash was a car that just went by. Well, not really. It, it just, it's the way the sun was. And I was probably, where they were, I was probably 100 <coughs> yards from the road. And you can tell um, otters have been around because they run and then they glide on their bellies. Then they run and they slide on their bellies. And I've seen where they've had lots of fun sliding down bankings onto the ice. Then they do it again. And um, like I said, I, I believe animals ha have a sense of humor and, and they like to have fun. You can see there was there's one, two, there's three otters right there went, went down the ice. And like I said, I never know when they're gonna when they're gonna pop up. <laughs> and, and and this one popped up one day, and uh, I was looking at it, and it was sniffing me, I think, or it, it heard. Otters have a tremendous sense of hearing, and sometimes they can hear the clicking on my camera, and uh, on a real calm morning. And this, I was watching this otter, and it, he popped up. And it wasn't until I'd been watching him for a few minutes that I noted, noticed he had two, yeah, he had two of his, the whole, whole family of them. And then this, I took this picture last, last spring. I was um, taking pictures of some great blue herons. And I didn't see this otter coming. And all of a sudden, he started barking at me. And I, I was up on a little bit of a hill, probably 25, 30 feet up from the water. And I looked down, and he just... It was, it was just like a dog. They got a high-pitched dog, like a uh, bark, like a small dog. And he yipped and yipped a couple times, and then he turned around and just off he went. And I think this is the same otter that I just showed you that had the three young with it. It's the same pond in the same place, only I was taking pictures of this great blue heron. And, and he, po he, he, po he popped up. Yeah. Oh, I get photobombed all the time doing this. And every now and then, I have the feeling somebody's watching me. And I love these great blue herons, too. They, they weigh five to six pounds. Their bones are hollow. Their wingspan is seven feet. Um, they're just starting to come back now. People are just starting to see them. I have yet to see one. But there's three or four ponds that I watch. And, and they're what they call colonial nesters because they like to nest in a colony. Um, you must all be familiar with the one down on Route 2 going into Boston. Well, that's, that's what they're like. But they're not that many out there. There's, there's one, one pair that I've been watching, and it's just the two of them for every year. There's two of them. But they have what they call monocular vision, if you've ever tried to sneak up on them. And what monocular vision means that one eye can look this way and the other eye can look that way. So they can, they can see what's coming on e either side of them. Owls have the, have the, same, the same type of uh, setup. And because they can, uh, like the way this guy's got his neck all crunched down, they have a uh, special vertebrae in their neck that allows them to, to do this. And this is the pair I was just mentioning. These are the only ones here. And this was the first week of April last year. 
Um, I watched these birds from the first day they showed up. Uh, I wouldn't go in every day, but I was about 120 yards away from these guys. And they never, all the pictures I took of them, they, they never knew I was up there. And uh, the males always bring the sticks in to the female, and the females always put the nest, the, the sticks in the nest, and they do this little ritual dance that they do when, when the male hands the stick over to the female, and then, and then she'll put it where she wants to put it. Um, couple, well, let's see, this would probably be into May, and th these, these chicks would be probably two weeks old. And it's really fun to watch them get older and older. Um, you can get some spectacular pictures of the herons coming in to feed them. And they don't carry frogs and snakes live into the nest. Um, they catch them, they swallow them, and they regurgitate them when they come back into the nest like this. And the, the, uh, the chicks go wacky. And, and the, big, the bigger they are, the more racket. And, and the shorter the amount of time the adult stand, you can see the, one of the adults right there. And these kids are all fighting over what she just barfed all over the nest. <laughs> but uh, I'm really surprised that uh, some adult herons don't lose their eyesight because these guys, and you can hear them, you can hear them from, you know, a half, three quarters of a mile from the pond you can tell there's a heron, a heron nest being fed. There was a heronry in the late 80s. There were 52 nests in it. And I went in to see it a couple times, and it was, it was just deafening. And it takes them probably 12 to 14 weeks to learn how to fly. And they're very rickety, and they get up, and they do stuff like this. And once these birds um, leave the nest, the adults will not feed them. So if they leave a nest, they, in order to get fed, they have to figure out how to get back up into the nest, which they usually do. I've seen them leave the nest, but I've never hung around long enough to see how they get, how they get back up in. But within two or three weeks, the chicks are all gone, the adults are gone, and I go in to see what's going on, and it seems kind of empty after spending two and a half months going in there and watching everybody. And I called this guy Gronk because he, uh, they, they fly great blue herons. They're not very uh, musical. Their note is Gronk. And when I found this pond, there was this huge log that was probably 35 or 40 yards out into the pond. And I found a place where I could get right down in there with my lens and there were bushes in front of me, and I thought, this is great. Now all I have to do is wait for a bird to come and land on this, especially a great blue heron. And uh, so I waited, and I waited, and there were all kinds of birds coming and going. There was otters, but no takers to land on my perch. And one day I heard, Grok! And I looked, and Harry was coming right across the pond, and he was coming right at me. So I thought, yes. <laughs> and uh, this, that's the picture that I got when he, when he came in. Actually, I took a lot of pictures of him landing, but that'll give you an idea of how skinny they are. They're only five pounds, but was for such a big bird. And, the, and bald eagles have the same seven-foot wingspan, so their, their wings are the same, same size as the eagles. And he kept coming back and back, and he would stand there, and sometimes he would, he would catch a fish in there. There's a, you see, he's got a little, little horn pout. And sometimes he'd catch a big one, and when they catch big fish like that, and, and they're alive, they take them into the grass, and they, they just keep spearing them and spearing them and shaking them and shaking them until they're dead. And then they, they get them just right, and, they throw their heads up and down the hatch these, these fish go. This, this one likes um, uh, lettuce with his sushi. <laughs> but they, they just go. They see something and there's no, no hesitation. 
Uh, they see it, but sometimes they'll they'll watch something for hours and hours and or minutes and minutes and not get anything. And I I took I kept taking pictures, kept, kept taking video, and it would go two and three minutes. And I thought I don't have an editing program, so I thought I'm not going to be able to use it. And one day I saw this guy creeping along, so I thought this is going to be a real short one. So. If you've never seen a heron, I love this. Grease lightning. Down the hatch. You know what? I love that. I got to see that again. <laughs> yeah. And what they usually do is they'll, they'll spend uh, a couple hours in the morning feeding. And then they'll find a place in the sun and they'll snooze. Sometimes they'll snooze an hour. Sometimes they'll snooze an hour and a half. And they preen. Herons and egrets, they spend hours and hours and hours just sitting there just preening their feathers. And this is a green heron. And the same, they operate the same way. This is a juvenile green heron because the wings, you can see the wings aren't fully formed yet, but they, they fly, they can fly around. And these guys are probably a little less than half the size of a great blue heron. And they're, they're daredevils. They, they just, they're nuts when they see stuff. They go right after it. And this one discovered my perch. And I don't know what kind of fish that is he's got, but he got it down in the hole there. And then he get up and when you catch a fish, it's never good to wave around your catch when there's otters around because, <laughs> like I said, I never know when I'm gonna see an otter. And this is an, a, fully, a full adult green heron and this bird sat in front of me for 45 minutes preening. Every little feather I watched, every edge of the feather, they would, they would pull their beak down. I mean, look, look at how, how, how he's picking that right down. If you've ever seen a bird's feather, they've got like little zippers on them, and that's what they do by preening, that's what I mean. They, they take each feather individually and they run their bill along it and it just zips it right up. So the next day they can go and open them all up again while they're catching fish. And this is a, a green heron, a juvenile green heron, and this is a belted kingfisher. The males um, don't have the brown on them, the females do. And I got this picture home and I looked at it and I looked at it and I thought, there's no scientific value I can get out of this picture, except they both go to the same hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bullfrog, big bullfrog that popped up on front of me and was jumping for flies. This is a painted turtle. Um, these, these turtles and yellow spotted turtles are the two turtles that come out early in the spring. And this is a yellow spotted turtle. You can see it looks like somebody just took a, a paintbrush and just threw them over, uh, paint all over the back of it. These guys are endangered, uh, excuse me, they're threatened in Massachusetts. They're very hard to find. And the painted turtles are a dime a dozen. And whenever you see turtles in June on the road, I'm sure you've all seen turtles in June on the roads. What, what that is is they're female turtles and they're 
off to lay eggs. And historically, they seem to know every year where the sand pits are, the sand sandbars to, to lay their eggs. Like the snapping turtles, they, they only come out of the water for two or three hours to um, take and lay their eggs. And what they do is they'll, they'll dig a big hole with their hind legs, they'll lay eggs, and then they'll cover the hole back up, and then they'll go back to the pond. Now, what that means is that evening or that night sometime, a coyote, a raccoon, an opossum, a skunk, any one of those, a fox that's got good, good smell will come and they'll dig the hole up and they'll have a supper of eggs, turtle eggs. But they don't get them all. So that's why the turtle species keep, you know, um, recruiting young ones every year. And there's a pair of them. This was in a cemetery. And uh, let's see, this one, this one came in just as that one was leaving. I felt like I needed to be a traffic cop. And there's another, this is a, a bumblebee um, on, a, on a mullen plant. And it was, I thought I'd just take a picture with a 500 millimeter lens and see what it comes out like. So there, there it is. You see he's got the pollen. Um, I, I'm not really good on bumblebees. Um, I don't know how many species there are in Massachusetts. I, I should probably learn it. And this is a, a fritillary, what they call a fritillary. I got a, I bought a new, a, a, what they call a new micro lens this summer, and you can take pictures close up like this. And I went nuts for a week or so taking pictures of everything, including my cats. I had pictures of my cat's eyes and the hair in my cat's ears. And, And this is the most common dragonfly in the United States. This is called a blue dasher. And this is a kingfisher early in the morning. The best time to take pictures, as far as I'm concerned, is early in the morning when the sun is coming up. A lot of, a lot of photographers call it the golden hour. And there's a pair of hummingbirds that come in. There's a whole patch of jewelweed and it's right on the shore of one of these ponds where the beavers are located that I go to to photograph and this female kept landing on the same the same place so when things were slow I would just set set the um, camera up he headed right on this and it wasn't long before she she'd show up and I have quite a few, taken quite a few pictures on, on this log also. This is a, a stump out in the water. There's a, a male bluebird early, early, early in the morning before the sun had even come up. In fact, I was surprised this even came out. It was so dark when I took that picture. And speaking of dark, the, the early pictures that I showed you of the, um, the beavers, I went in there one morning and it was, I could hardly see to get in there. And the beavers were working back and forth. So I set the camera up and I thought, I wonder if I can take a picture with it being this dark. So I had a pen light with me. And so I set everything up and I took a picture right here, minus the raccoon. And I looked at the picture in the, in the back of the camera and I was amazed at how, how light it was. So I looked back in the viewfinder, and here's this raccoon standing right there, right where I was aimed. So I have a, I use a cable release, um, which is a wire that connects up to the camera, and it's a button on your hand. And it saves, especially in, in real uh, dark situations where your shutter speed is so slow, it'll, it'll save the wiggling of the camera of you pushing down on your finger, uh, even on the tripod, it'll, it'll rumble it a little. So I've got this cable release that eliminates that. And this, this raccoon, I, I took one picture and that was it. And uh, when I got home, I was kind of surprised that it 
came out the way it did for being almost pitch dark. There's a mink, um, the weasel family, got that little, little white chin. Um, they're nasty animals, they eat anything. Frogs, small animals, small birds. I was watching one this past fall. The water was down at the quabbin. I was in the quabbin and the water was down quite a ways and I was in this little cove and I saw a mink come out of the woods and it came down and it ran around the ice in front of me and it crossed and it went up the hill behind me. So a couple days later, I was in the same spot and I had my camera set up and I caught something out of the corner of my eye and I've, I've learned, I, this is one of the first things I learned was never move quick, you know, like if you're taking pictures and something comes flying in, if you go quick for your camera, it's going to go. So I, I saw this thing coming down the, the bank and, and so I turned my head around slowly and it was the mink and he was coming right for me. And I had a camouflage jacket on and I had some camo pants on and it was really cold. And uh, that mink came down and it went, it went right under my tripod and right out the other side and out onto the ice. And uh, I, just, I, you know, I just shook my head, I couldn't believe it. And this is a little muskrat eating an acorn. Popped up and said, hey, take my picture. I said, okay. This is a porcupine on a bad hair day. This was a young one. Um, I was taking some pictures of bears and uh, the manager of the orchard knew I was in there. They gave me permission to go in and he said to me, if you see any porcupines, he says, let us know. He says, we trap them and get, out, get them out of there. So I was standing on, on the edge of the, the orchard and I heard some noise behind me and I turned around and looked and this little guy was climbing up this cherry tree, red cherry tree, and he kept getting higher and higher and higher. So I, I walked out front, turned around, took his picture. This is a baby chipmunk. This wall, this wall that, that is on, it's in a cemetery. A lot of my ancestors buried in this, in this cemetery. So I was in there one afternoon and I was all done taking pictures and I was looking at gravestones and there was an elderly woman that had been feeding birds um, on the end of the wall in a crabapple tree. And I noticed when I got there, one of the feeders was on the ground and there was a red squirrel in it feeding. So I didn't think any more of it. A little while later, I noticed that there were chipmunks running back and forth on the wall. So being the shop lad that I am, I thought, I'm gonna see if I can take some pictures of these chipmunks running with their, with their pouches filled. I didn't think it was gonna take me three hours and 300 pictures, but. <laughs> and I, I noticed by what I started I started up against the wall taking the pictures and they would come down the wall towards me and they'd get about 20 feet ahead of me and they'd go down on the other side of the wall and, and they'd run over the wall and then they'd come back up on the wall behind me and they'd continue on. So I started moving further and further out into the road until they were going back and forth. But it took me about an hour before I realized that they were they were running down the wall on the same track that they were coming back on. It was like a road. They were going down the wall on the left-hand side, and when they were coming back, they were on the left-hand side coming back. So I took, I think I took 357 pitches that afternoon. And out of them, I had 10 pitches of chipmunks in the air and I, no I take it back I had 25 pitches of them in the air and there was always something wrong with one of them there were either the the eyes 
were blurry, the feet were blurry, the tail was blurry, but I had five that were, that were pretty good. And so I took these two and I made prints of these and I sell prints at crafts fairs in, in the fall. And uh, I, I can't keep enough of these, these pictures. People just seem to really like, like these two pictures. And did everybody notice squirrels everywhere this past, past fall, last summer? Boy, there were squirrels everywhere because the, the acorns were so good the year before that the, the breeding squirrels went nuts. And this year there wasn't, so there, was, there wasn't enough food for them. So the first time in my life I have ever seen squirrels swim. And almost every day I went into Quabbin or some of these beaver ponds, I would see squirrels swimming. <laughs> This is, this, this is a no-no. I didn't tell the orchard owner what I knew about what was going on in her orchard. And these guys, a lot of people don't like these guys, but I do. They're, they're busy all day long. They're always going. And this guy had this spot, and, and these guys will He's a red squirrel, and they will find a place to feed, and they'll go back and they'll feed in the same place day after day after day. Sometimes if you walk through like hemlock, they love hemlock cones. You can see these, these piles a foot and a half high of hemlock cones that have been all chewed down like, like a piece of corn on the cob. And some friends of mine, um, this is a gray fox, some friends of mine went to Maine and a couple of days before they left, they said, we've got an animal living in the rock pile out behind the house and we, we, we don't know what it is, but it drives our dogs nuts. So we're gonna be gone, so why don't you come down and see what you can find out? They wanted me to bring my trail camera down there and I thought, well, heck, I'll just go down. So I got down there in the morning and I wasn't there 10 minutes and this female gray fox popped up. And I'll tell you something about gray fox that some of you probably don't know because I didn't know this until I read it in a book about fox. There are seven species of fox in the world. The gray fox is the only one that can climb trees and they, do, they will, I didn't see it climb a tree but they, they climb trees to get away from danger and is, to look out and see what's, what's going on out there. But this female came in and uh, she sensed me right away and I was quite a ways away. But it didn't, didn't stop her. She's right in, right in front of the den. Just a beautiful animal. And she had three young ones. And I don't know um, what, what, they, what they were playing with but there was a, this big pile of rocks and they were all covered with moss. And, and it was, the only thing I could think of was when I was a kid, uh, they had this game called bang a mole. It was just like, I never knew where they were gonna pop up. Sometimes one would come up on the top and the two others would be over here and then they'd disappear and they'd all three of them would come up in one spot. And it was, it was quite, quite a lot of fun watching them. And I don't know what these guys were watching, but boy, they spent a lot of time watching something. I don't know if there was a snake in there or what. This is a great egret. Um, I love these guys. They, they're, the heron family, a lot of people call them white herons, but they are herons and they are white, but they're what they call great egrets. You can see they've got the black legs. And they've got yellow bills. In, in the breeding season, they've got a, nice streak of fluorescent green right there. You can just barely make it out. And these birds, they, they nest um, uh, down along the Connecticut coast up to the Cape, but they don't nest inland in Massachusetts anywhere. And what happens is in July and August when the chicks have left, left the nest, they wander. So they'll show up in around Quabbin. And this, I took these pictures on the Connecticut River. 
And there's a, a pond out there, they call it the, the power canal. The power company is, backs up this big pond that's almost a mile long. And it's about a half a mile wide and they use it for a generator. But it's a wonderful place for birds. Right now the place is loaded with um, all kinds of birds. Last week there were 19 t uh, tundra swans out there and tundra swans are almost unheard of in Massachusetts. Um, let alone 19 of them, and they were there for two days. But this was last fall, and I, somebody told me about these guys, and I went up and I watched them, and I had more fun, and I spent more time up there watching these guys. Um, they will have fish and right squabbles with a heron. You can see they're um, not quite as big as great blue heron. Uh, once again, this is seven feet from here to here. And he's making away with the, the breakfast. That'll give you an idea of, of the size of them. But th there were 10 or 12 of them in this pond. <laughs> but they, like I told you, the heron, it's a heron. They, they just preen and preen and preen and preen. And I went in there one morning and it was totally foggy. And I thought, this isn't going to work because I'm not going to, I'm not going to see anything. And all of a sudden, the fog started lifting, and these guys started flying around. And it was, it was a fun time. Wood ducks, a female wood duck, she popped up in front of me, took a picture. Next day, the male popped up in front of me, took his picture. And the thing I like about these, these ducks are, is the female, they always have their ducks in a row. <laughs> Geese, Canada geese, they're everywhere out there now. They're migrating. This guy right here comes back to the same pond. I know it's the same goose because he's got that band every year. This is a, this will be, if he comes back this year, this will be the fifth year in a row. They nest on beaver lodges. There's three or four beaver lodges in this pond. And the last two years, they've used the same exact spot. And this was from two years ago. Um, this uh, hooded mergansers, these are coming around right now. They're small, small ducks. They do nest here. Um, right now, there's a lot of them on the Connecticut River. Any place you've got open water, you can find these guys now. The males are just beautiful. And that's a female with her drowned rats. They, these, these birds, these chicks were underwater all, constantly. You can look at them, I mean, they're just soaking wet. She doesn't look like she's too happy. Probably because she just came from the hairdresser. <laughs> Don't get my hair wet. This is, uh, these are um, common regansas. These are a couple of males. And these guys went by me, and I couldn't figure out what, what they were arguing about. But then I saw Mrs. Merganser. And I see she just came from the hairdresser, and she's had her lipstick on. And these uh, females have a trait, what they, they call nest dumping. And if, say, this female is on a nest and she's got 10, they have lots of eggs. If she's got eight or nine eggs, 10 eggs, she leaves the nest for something. Another female, common merganza, will come by and she'll say, hmm, a nest. So she'll drop on and she'll drop in six or eight eggs and then she'll leave. So this one comes back. Now she's got 16 or 18 eggs to hatch. Um, ducks don't feed their chicks individually like robins do. Once the ducks hatch, they're on their own. Immediately they're on their own. They instinctively know what, what to get. Um, but one day I was sitting along the shore and I saw um, a female coming. And they also, they will also, if a female has got 10 or 12 chicks and she sees this female with 10 or 12 chicks, she'll drive up, so, uh, yeah, she'll drive up. She'll swim up so all the chicks intermingle and then she'll say, I've had enough of this, I'm out of here. And that's when you get, um, the, the, there she is with chicks. That's when you get things like this. But this right here. 
There's, there's 31 chicks in this. And you can see there's, there's three different age classes in there. I mean, this guy is pretty big. Um, there's some little ones, and that one's a little bigger one. And, and here they are in the fall, nothing but young thugs chasing minnows. And loons, I love the loons. Um, we do have common loons. Lisa didn't realize that they were there, but I'm, I've always, they have a, a loon program where they monitor the loons at Quabbin every summer, and they do it from May until September 1st. They're very territorial, so we know where they're gonna be, and they come back to the same territories every year. Um, the males weigh between 13 and 15 pounds. Females are a little smaller. Their wingspan is four feet. They have webbed feet that are so far in the back that they can't walk. They push themselves along on their belly. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, they, they stay, they show up early now. There's loons probably at the Quabbin right now because there's a lot of open water. And they'll stay until December. I've seen loons the second or third week of December there. And they migrate during the day. They don't migrate far. They just go off either to the, the Gulf of Maine or down to the Long Island Sound. They don't go very far. They're fish eaters, but they will eat crawfish and um, other, other underwater insects, anything they can find. And see where the legs are up on the back there? And what these, this pair of birds are doing, this guy, we call this guy white, Whitey because he's got a, a stripe of white on the back of his head. And they nest on the ground. They'll make a scrape like that, and they'll lay the eggs in it. And it was in April, and these guys were really early, but they were, they were out scouting out a place. This is what they, what they nest like. They pull all this stuff right up. And, and as you can imagine, being uh, not able to walk in, in a reservoir of the water that goes up and down, sometimes they can get into trouble. When the water goes, um, goes down, it's, it can go down far enough so that they can't get to the, to the nest. And if the water goes up, the nest will be flooded out. But what they've done at Quabbin, they started doing it in 1990, is they made these loon rafts. And as you can see, the loons use them. And they're eight by eight, and they've got buoyant stuff underneath it to keep them up. We put sod on it so the birds can nest in the sod. And there are two long um, piece of wire anchored with huge cement anchors so it isn't going to go anywhere. But when the water comes up, the nest goes up. And when the water goes down, the water goes down. Uh, the nest goes down. They don't always use them, as you can see. We put, this was a brand new one, and this bird just decided not to use it. And I saw this, and it, it really bothered me, so I thought, I gotta figure out why this bird wouldn't use this nest. So I waited till the fall, in the winter, when they, we take these out of the water, when we put them up on the shore. And I walked in, and I thought, if it's good enough for me, why isn't it good enough for that loon? <laughs> so I didn't have any problem with it. So I scratched my name in the corner and passed. And these are just some, some loon chick pitches that I've taken over the last four or five years. There's Whitey. He's got two chicks under his wing. We went in the following week, and um, they were out. They were a little bigger the following week. And then we found him uh, the third week, and they were a little bigger, and he, was, he had graduated from fish. He's got a, a crayfish right there for him. But in 19, uh, the mid, let's see, I guess it was the mid to late 80s, there was a graduate student up in Maine, and he discovered a way to catch loons so they can put colored leg bands on them. So all of the loons at Quabbin have been caught and when they caught them, they took blood samples and they're trying to start up a DNA, uh, a DNA database of all the loons. 
And we have a database that we have with us in the boat when we go out. We do it once a week. We check on every pairs of loons. Last year there were, there were 22 pairs of loons out there and they had 17 chicks successfully fledged. But I always take a camera with me because sometimes you, you don't get to see uh, birds like this. When a loon finishes preening, it just weaves its head around, uh, its foot around, and um, we can get the colors. So we could tell by just by this, we could tell when it was banded, where it was, and but um, a lot of times they'll they'll come by so fast, and I have this cam I have my camera with me, and we can tell who this bird is. We can see both the bands. My favorite e bird of the eagle, I was lucky enough to be working on the reintroduction program in the 80s when they reintroduced bald eagles at the Quabbin Reservoir. I have another book coming out in September and I've got a whole section in there about this particular project. But basically what they did was they brought chicks down from uh, up in, up in parts of Canada, and they raised them at Quabbin until they were 14 weeks old, and then they released them. And uh, they never saw humans. They were in a cage with had one-way glass on it. And a bald eagle is like a salmon. It'll imprint on a, on a pond that it grows up in or a lake. So it was hoped that we could get eagles to nest at Quabbin, and, and that's what happened. Uh, the program went for seven years. There were 42 eagles released. And now, from those 42 eagles, every eagle in Massachusetts um, came from these birds. And this year is the 30th anniversary year of the first pair of eagles nesting at the Quabbin. These birds um, were, I took this on the Connecticut River. Uh, like all birds of prey, the males are larger. I mean, uh, the females are larger than the males. This, this is the female and this is the, the male. And it was really windy that day and they landed in front of me and I wished I knew what was taking place here. But I didn't take me long to find out and I can't show you the next picture because it's X-rated. Um, and here's one of the nests at Quabbin. There's a chick right there that you can see. It takes a bald eagle four and a half to five years for the head and tail to turn white. And when the head and tail is white, then it, it's sexually mature. Eagles are sitting on eggs right now. They'll hatch sometimes in, in April. When the chicks get to be 12, 14 weeks old, they leave the nest, but they don't go far. They just hang around, just like teenagers. And they let mom and dad bring all the food into them. <coughs> By the end of the summer, they're out harassing all their adult, all their parents, still wanting food. And this is a young one that hadn't quite left the nest yet. Look at the claws on that bird. Fish and wildlife, they climb the trees. They know where every pair is in Quabbin. And every year, they send somebody up the tree, and they send the bird down in a sack. They give it um, physical, and they put leg bands on it, they take blood samples, they take you know, all kinds of samples from the bird to make sure that it's healthy. And this is a year old bird. And if you see birds long enough, if you watch eagles long enough, you can tell what they look like every year. You know, young ones have a lot of white in them and their, their beak is almost a, a dull green. And as it gets older, the beak starts to get yellower and yellower. So by the time it's an adult bird, it's got a full, full yellow beak. This bird, you can't see it, but this bird's got a fish. This bird has got a fish. <laughs> we were eating lunch one day and we were drifting the qua in the quab and it was a real calm day. And I had my camera just sitting beside me and we were eating lunch and the, the, the guy that I did the loon projects with. He says, hey, look, here comes an eagle. And it, it just came right by us. You can see the band on the leg right there also. 
And this pair of birds right now, I was in there yesterday morning, there's a bird sitting in the nest right now. And these birds nest, these birds have been on this island for 20 years. I don't know if they're the same birds, but they, they nest, there's a pair of eagles in this nest every year. And you can see them sitting up there. That's their favorite place to sit. And they're, they're sitting up there, and there's a pair of fox running across the ice. A lot of, a lot of barred owls lately have been down here because there was uh, so many chicks hatched last year, and now there's no food for them up there. So out in western Massachusetts, everywhere you look, there were barred owls. People had barred owls sitting on their bird feeders. And I found these two or three eagles, uh, owls, I should say, that were around these three fields. And I spent all kinds of owl, hours taking pictures of these barred owls, catching mice and voles, and I learned a lot. It's a flying mouse trap. <laughs> they call them barred owls because of the, the barred around the neck. Um, they're the most common owl, and they got a call like this sound in who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? They don't have wing tufts. Um, the largest owl we have around here is the great horned owl. And they're a little bigger than these guys. And they're sitting on eggs right now. There's a peregrine falcon that flew right through these crows one day and it landed on a rock. And I took pictures of it. And this is the fastest bird in the world. And um, not this particular bird. <laughs> peregrine falcons. Um, you can see the leg bands. And I took the numbers and I sent them to Tom French, who just retired from Division of Fish and Wildlife. He was a friend of mine. And uh, he told me that this is one of the birds that was raised on the Monarch Place Tower in Springfield. And this was the first time it had been photographed. It was six months old when I took this picture. And he sent me a picture of it the following year. And there was a picture of it. Someone had taken a picture of it on one of the bridges in Boston. And the last I knew is it, it's nesting um, out on Deer Island. And this is a Cooper's hawk. I was sitting on, under a tree one day, and this Cooper's hawk landed up here. It was in the migration. And there was chipmunks in the woods behind me. And all of a sudden, he, he zeroed in on me. And, I didn't know if he was going to hit me between the eyes or what he was going to do, but I was looking through the camera and he came right at me and I just held down on the shutter speed and I think he was after the, one of the chipmunks and he saw me at the last time and he pulled up. All right, red tail, red tail hawk. It's a juvenile red, ta red tail hawk. There's a pair of red tail hawks. Um, this is a red shouldered hawk in the fall. Some of the birds of prey that you can see around, these are out at Quab and Ospreys. Um, ospreys were almost extinct because of uh, all the DDT that the fish, they were spraying the fields and the same thing with the eagles. They were eating the fish and it was affecting their uh, eggs. The, the, it affected the calcium in the birds and the birds were laying the eggs and the weight of the birds were cracking the eggs before they could hatch. And um, this is a young moose. There are quite a few moose out at Quabbin. And I found this one particular place. There was a couple of fields. And I don't know what they were hanging around the fields for. But the, you can see here's a, a young bull. Uh, there's a female. And this one surprised me. And I don't know who was more surprised, her or I. But you can see that she wasn't too happy that I was, I was there. But she just stood there looking. And I was so close to her that. I just stood there, and she's got her breakfast in her mouth. And when she realized I wasn't going to be a threat to her, she went off into the woods a little closer than I wanted to be, but I wasn't going to turn around and run. I was surprised to hear you say DDT. I thought that was out. Well, in the 70s. Oh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, yeah, a long time, yeah, a long time ago. It took them that long to come back. Um, this, this is a young bull. I was in the field. I knew these. I knew these moose were coming through the fields, and I was in there one day, and I 
heard the ground shaking and this guy came running and he stopped long enough for me to take a picture or two. And then I found him a little while later um, with another, another bull moose. He was probably half a mile away. But for three or four days I was going in there and I kept seeing all these, all these moose. This is what they call, they call this one the Prescott bull because it was in the Prescott area, Quabbin, where I took this picture. And it had a collar on it, had a radio collar on it for two or three years. And they, it was a satellite collar, so they could, they could find out where it was every day. So they got a lot of data, data off this, this moose. And when I sent it um, to Dave Waddles, who's the, the moose biologist for the state, he was really happy to find that it was still alive. And you can see the antler, the funny antler that it had. That's how, how they recognized it. But the next day, I went out there, and I didn't see a moose anywhere. And I couldn't figure it out. I thought, well, how could these moose just disappear? And so on my way back to the car, I got almost back to the car, and I, I noticed this sign on, on, a, on a tree right next to the car. So I just scratched I just scratched my head and even the deer were laughing at that one. <laughs> There's not really much I have to say about deer. Everybody's familiar with them. These are at the Quabbin. This these are in the summer in early morning. Um, late summer. And you really you really gotta be quiet around these guys. This is in the beaver pond that the first beavers I showed you were there. And this guy ate some jumping beans. This just kept jumping around and around and around. I thought I heard her say, stop it, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> Twins. Has the tick population done um, any damage to the animals? Um, not, not that we're aware of. Um, the moose um, are coming through theirs too. We haven't seen a lot of tick damage from the moose ticks. This is, this is a picture on the back of my cover uh, on my book, these two. There were three of them, and er almost every day the three of them would come out. This day there was just the two of them. But it don't take much to ha have, a, have a deer snoop you out. This guy walked out of the woods one day, and it was, he, it was perfect. He stopped right uh, where the spotlight was. Coyotes, um, there's quite a few coyotes out at Quabbin. I love, I love seeing coyotes. There is six of them crossing the ice in a little bit of a snowstorm. This was last year. There was, um, there was a deer carcass. Sometimes they chase deer onto the ice to kill them sometimes, and they feed on them. Um, coyotes don't kill just for the fun of it. I've heard a lot of people say that. Um, but this guy was out there, and he was just leaving, leaving the carcass. So I went back in the next day and um, found the carcass again. This, uh, let's see, it's this guy right here. I see this coyote every year. And I call him Patch because he's got a white patch on his back. This was two or three years ago. He was with a mate right there on the side. I was up in the woods and I was just watching and they came out. And this was last the same patch. You can almost make out the patch. He went around the corner of this little island. Then he came back around and he was hunting for mice. And he just had the patience. And I, I know he knew that I was standing. I wasn't in the woods, but I wasn't right out in the open either. And he, he walked around and he looked up and he looked, and I think he heard the, cam the shutter of the camera, but he didn't quite know where he was. You can see the patch. So he just, he just decided that he was gonna sit down. And <laughs> so how you doing, Dale? Haven't seen you in a year or so. Yeah, yeah, well, hey, listen, get my good side, will you? <laughs> well, I got to go now. I'm hungry. There's one. 
Off he went. And here he is uh, two years ago. There's his, there's his patch right there, almost in the same spot I just showed you. This, this picture is in the book. And here he is not two months ago. Um, this, I don't know how this deer died on the ice. I know it's cruel, but it, you know, it, it happens. And um, it takes about 24 hours, 20, I'll say 24 to 36 hours, and, and that deer was totally gone. The, the eagles, uh, crows, ravens, at night, if six or eight coyotes come in on it, it ain't gonna last long. Here's another one I saw in a field one day, pouncing up and down. He, uh, his parents told him, never told him not to play with your food. So I'm picking up my food and leaving. And the last thing I want to talk about is bears. There's a, um, an orchard just up the road from me, and the woman had bears this year. She had bears everywhere. And um, I learned a lot about bears just by spending two or three hours in the morning and two or three hours at night. And the woman um, really was upset because she had to shut down her feed your, uh, pick your own, uh, that she had the people come in, pay to pick their own apples, and she didn't dare having them in there. The bears were coming out in the middle of the day, and so I got wind of it, and I, I knew her, and I asked her if I could go in, and oh, she says, sure. She says, drive your car in there if you want, and I said, well, I, I don't want to, you know, but well, she says, just be careful of the bears. She says, I don't trust them. And she says, the sooner they leave, the happier I'm going to be. So, but these, these things, I bought this book, and it's all about black bears. And these are some of the things that I learned. Black bears need 20,000 calories a day while fattening up by emanation. One seven-pound bird feeder full of sun, sunflower seeds will provide that. So that's one reason why they go after bird, bird feeders. And this one really amazed me. Bears can smell a grilling chicken from five miles away. Um, they can see as good as we do. They, they think they can hear in the ultrasonic range of 16 to 20 kilohertz. And the ears never grow. And, and one thing I learned, I learned to tell the bears from the size of their ears. Uh, Mass Wildlife estimates it's 4,500 bears. And this is the cover of my next book. This is the first bear picture I took. I walked in and I walked up on this guy and he was watching me and I was a little closer than I wanted to be, but I thought, well, maybe I can run faster scared than he can mad. But I didn't need to. I, I, took, I took a picture of him and he just looked at me and picked up his apple and off he went into the woods. This is a young one. Um, there was a female that had two cubs and they were really funny because they'd come out of the woods and they would take their time. They'd really sneakily walk up to an apple that was on the ground. They'd grab the apple and then they'd take off and they'd run like hell back for the woods. See, so he's got an apple hanging out of his mouth. And there's one eating his apple, and this guy's making his plan. They're pretty, pretty good-sized bears. And here again, I was these bears, I was 80 to 100 yards away from these bears. Um, sometimes I think I, they knew I was there. But then I wondered, because sometimes if a, a car would go by, or if somebody would be walking by the orchard, and they'd hear the voices, man, they'd be out of there. And here's the female. See, see the male, the, one of the cubs right there coming out. But she, she didn't see me, but she knew I was there. And I was, I was halfway up the orchard, and I was up behind a stone wall. And, and she seemed to sense I was there, and, and, and she left. And I walked in one morning in a pouring rain at 10 o'clock, not expecting to see any bears. And this bear was sitting there, and he turned around, and he looked at me like, I had a hole in my head. And these are just some facts about bears, what, what they need in the, what, what they get in the wild. 
um, as opposed to what a jelly donut is, 310 calories. A pound of cranberries is 166 calories. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich, 490 calories. 10 frames of bees and honey, 68,672 calories. And this guy, he just, he had some apples in mind and he didn't know whether he was gonna, what he was gonna do. And he just looked and looked and looked and then he stood there and he looked at me and he, I was way down the other end of the orchard. And finally, he realized I wasn't gonna be a threat to him and I thought he was gonna go for this one but he had another one in mind. And he grabbed it and off he went. They were really funny because they'd, they'd really come out, they'd pussyfoot out, you know. And The minute they had that apple in the mouth, man, they were out of there, kind of like bank robbers. And this is a different bear. This has a ra radio collar on it. Um, this, had, this bear had two cubs with it also. But I got the numbers, the tags on the ear. Bobcats, one more thing. I'm talking too much. Um, they weigh between 19 and 22 pounds. A friend of mine told me that there was a, a deer carcass on the ice and there was a bobcat feeding on it. So I, I went in and sure enough, and it, I, I watched it gnaw on the bones for 20 minutes or so. And this is the bobcat on the cover. And this is another bobcat crossing the ice with a squirrel. We had a bobcat catch a squirrel right in front of us in our feeder last Saturday morning. And it was um, like greased lightning and the cat was gone. So was the squirrel. Anyways, the last thing I wanted to tell you, um, ask you is balloons um, are really not good for the habitat. They uh, animals get hung up in them. Um, they let them go. They, those helium balloons that, that you can buy and stop and shop, those mylar ones, those things last forever. And this picture right here shows you what can happen. Here's a bald eagle all tied up in a, in a balloon. I don't know how in the world he got tied up in it. And, and if you if you have any weddings or if you have daughters or that are getting married, talk them out of doing the balloons. Tell them about that picture or something. It's, they're really not good. And if you fish, pick up your monofilament line. And if you see other people with it, just pick it up and put it in your pocket. Here's a, a female merganser with monofilament line. I couldn't get to this duck. It was moving pretty good. I, I can only suspect that this duck died of starvation because it certainly couldn't open its bill. Anyways, thanks for listening, and any questions? If I don't know the answers, uh, I, I'll just make up crap. <laughs> yes? The question about coyotes, we yep. have them around here. Yep. And every once in a while, I'll just limit it right out here. Oh, yeah. I love that. It lasts about five or ten minutes in the spots. Yeah. Are they feeding? No, they just, they just, they just do that. It's a, like a community howl. I used to race sled dogs. I had a sled dog team for 15 years, and my dogs used to do the same thing. Sometimes it would be 11 at night. Sometimes it would be 3 in the morning. And I'd, you know, I'd look out there sometimes, and they'd all have their noses up in the air. So I don't think it means anything in particular, you know. Any others? Well, thanks, everyone. I'm... Glad to see you.